Hola, mi gente. I'm Andrew. I'm a proud Puerto Rican, and in honor of National Hispanic Heritage Month, I want to highlight the hard-fought battles for increased Hispanic and Latinx representation in comics. Two of the videos we're most proud of are our deep dives on the rise of black and LGBTQ plus superheroes, and today we're taking a look at another underrepresented group that is making huge strides after decades of silence and stereotypes from mainstream pop culture. This is the history of Hispanic and Latinx superheroes. The precursor to all Hispanic heroes would have to be Don Diego de la Vega, better known as Zorro. Johnston McCulley's Spanish Vigilante debuted in 1919 and set the template for all mass adventurers that would follow in his wake. I wouldn't quite call him a superhero, but for a long time, he was the best that we got. Latinx and Hispanic superheroes wouldn't appear in mainstream American comics until the 70s, but fans in Mexico already had their own with one key difference. He was real. I'm talking about El Santo. You can trace the explosion of Mexican superheroes to June 28th, 1942, when a luchador named Rodolfo Guzman Huerta stepped out to the ring wearing a simple silver mask. El Santo, or the saint, wasn't the first wrestler to cover his face, but he was the first to truly capture the fans' imaginations. He quickly became a national icon and a Mexican folk hero, and soon his adventures grew too big for the squared circle to contain. With his secret identity, flowing cape, and spandex tights, Santo was already the spitting image of the Golden Age superheroes that were taking America by storm. His legendary rivalry with the Blue Demon was just as epic as Batman and the Joker, and the simple storytelling of Valiant Technicos battling evil Rudos translated perfectly to the four-color world of heroes and villains. Essentially, the guy was a living, breathing, f***ing superhero. The first El Santo comic books appeared in 1952, and they became so popular that soon they were releasing three new issues every week. Imagine getting three new Supermen every week. The flesh and blood Santo made the transition to the big screen in 1958, and he'd go on to star in 52 films total. God damn. So basically, he's been in more movies than Batman, Superman, and Spider-Man combined. That's not funny. And if you want to talk about a rogues gallery, it's tough to top Santo. He's fought zombies, blobs, vampires, the universal monsters, the four f***ing horsemen, and countless other foes. But unless you lived in Mexico or the southwestern United States, or if you were an MST3K fan, you'd have no idea how massive Santo and other luchadores who followed in his cinematic footsteps really were. Only a few of his movies were ever translated and released commercially in America, so U.S. audiences wouldn't experience Latinx superheroes until the Bronze Age. In the 50s and 60s, Latinx characters were either portrayed as stereotypical villains or spin-offs of established heroes, like the South American Bat Hombre and Gaucho. Meanwhile, black superheroes were finally starting to break through after the debut of Black Panther in 1966, but it would take nearly 10 more years for a Hispanic hero to even hit the scene. In 1975, Marvel became the first major publisher to roll out a Hispanic superhero when they introduced the White Tiger. And judging from their name, the company was clearly trying to capitalize on Black Panther's success. White Tiger, Black Panther, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. I mean, I got, what do you need? But the characters couldn't be more different. Hector Ayala wasn't a king. He was a Puerto Rican immigrant attending college in New York when he stumbled across three mystical ambulance of Kun Ko. Oh, <laughs> when he stumbled across three mystical amulets of Kun Lun. They endowed him with increased strength, speed, and skill in the martial arts. Also unlike Black Panther, White Tiger was actually co-created by an artist who shared his heritage, Puerto Rican legend George Perez. White Tiger didn't have the same impact as T'Challa, but he still paved a path of opportunity for future Hispanic and Latinx heroes to shine. And his sister Ava is still carrying on the legacy to this day. Two years later, Judge Margarito C. Garza created Relampago, who has a legit claim on being the first Mexican-American superhero. 
Garza was only able to self-publish three issues amidst concerns of copyright infringement. But Relampago earned his place in history nonetheless. DC was a little slower out the gate to introduce a Latinx hero of their own. One of their first attempts was Fire, a pyrokinetic Justice League member who hailed from Brazil. But Vibe is probably their most infamous misstep. Today, most people know Vibe from the CW Flash show, where he's played with a geeky charm by Colombian actor Carlos Valdez. These weren't made by Kaboom Boomerang. Kaboom Boomerang? That's not your best. Really? It makes perfect. Just go. But when Vibe was first introduced in the comics in 1984, he was little more than a collection of dumb stereotypes wrapped in an awful costume, a choice I'm sure a boardroom full of white people made. He was a gang leader on the mean streets of Detroit who gave up his life of crime when he heard the Justice League was opening up a branch in his hometown. He didn't give up his favorite hobby though, which was of course, breakdancing. Not great, but at least he's better than El Dorado, a Mexican hero created for the Super Friends cartoon. DC would do a little better as the 80s wound down, introducing characters like the second Wildcat, Yolanda Montez, and Extraño, who was also one of the first LGBTQ plus superheroes. Marvel was trickling out new Hispanic and Latinx heroes too. The Avengers recruited Firebird and Living Lightning. And in the multicultural ranks of the X-Men, we met new superheroes like Richter and Sunspot. But both companies were making progress and the number of Hispanic and Latinx heroes was about to explode as we entered the modern age. Let's put the big two aside for a second. Marvel and DC, you go over there. <laughs> because smaller companies were making huge strides in representation. While Marvel and DC were still beating around the bush, down in Texas, artist Richard Dominguez formed Azteca Productions and released his own lineup of comics centered around Hispanic heroes like Team Tejas, El Gato Negro, and a revival of Relampago. Once Hispanic and Latinx heroes started to get some buzz, the big two publishers slowly began to roll out more as the 90s got underway. 1992 was when we first met Rene Montoya, the queer Dominican Gotham detective who'd eventually take up the mantle of the question. Kyle Rayner debuted two years later, the Green Lantern who carried the flame during the corpse's darkest hour, and who we'd later learn was of Mexican-American descent. Granted, that was a retcon, but back then you'd take what you can get. This was the beginning of DC and Marvel using legacy heroes to introduce more diverse characters, like Jaime Reyes and El Paso Teen, who became the new Blue Beetle in 2006. Jaime was a big step forward for the more traditional DC universe, and he's an awesome Blue Beetle. I mean, you gotta try him out in Injustice too. He's, he's cool. Says you suck. But the character doesn't have the same widespread impact as someone like, oh, I don't know. Spider-Man! You can't both be Spider-Man. Okay, let's be fair and square. I'll be Spider-Man. I called it. Our first glimpse of a Hispanic Spidey came in 1992, when we met Miguel O'Hara, the futuristic Spider-Man of 2099. But he never reached the same heights of stardom as Miles Morales, an Afro-Latino kid who stepped up and became a hero in the wake of Peter Parker's death in Marvel's Ultimate Universe. Debuting in 2011, Miles gave comic fans a fresh perspective on the trials and tribulations of a teen superhero, and he spoke to a multicultural experience that's different but no less valid than the original Spideys back in the 60s. Being a teenager is being a teenager. Miles was merged into the main Marvel Universe in 2015, and his star has been on the rise ever since. From appearing in the blockbuster Spider-Man PS4 game to making his big screen debut in Enter the Spider-Verse, Miles helped kick open the floodgates and created opportunities for a new wave of Hispanic and Latinx heroes. From DC's Mexican-American Green Lantern Jessica Cruz to Marvel's queer Latinx ass kicker America Chavez, comics are slowly but surely beginning to reflect the rich diversity of our country and our world. And as the next generations of characters and creators enter the industry, the future for Hispanic and Latinx superheroes has never been brighter. I know that this change can be scary to some people, but change is good. This change is good. And knowing that there are heroes up in the sky who look like me and thousands of other kids opening up a comic book for the very first time gives Hispanic and Latinx fans the chance to feel something that they might not have ever experienced in comic books before. The chance to feel seen.
Thanks so much for watching, everyone. I hope you liked our look at Hispanic and Latinx heroes, and I hope I pronounced everything correctly. Although I am Puerto Rican, my parents never raised me on Spanish. Bummer. We couldn't include every single hero, so let us know your faves, anyone we might have left out, and as always, please subscribe to Now This Nerd.